thank you everyone for joining us on this session. Um, I am joined by my fabulous guests, um, whom I will introduce shortly. Um, this session is called Tony Morrison in Africa and its diaspora. And um, just to give you a brief background on Toni Morrison, for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with her, um, Toni Morrison had an illustrious and distinguished multifaceted, multifaceted career. Not only did she write numerous critically acclaimed novels, plays, short stories, and children's books, she was also a librettist and an astute essayist. The progressive recognition of her achievements culminated in her being awarded the prestigious International Nobel Prize in Literature in 1993, and she was the first Black woman of any nationality to have done so. And she has this year been honored with a U.S. Postal Service Forever stamp for her extraordinary and enduring contributions to American society. I think we can all agree that Morrison's work prompts the reimagining of our world, and in this session, we examine her continuing legacy to Africa and its diaspora. Focusing on the confluences between literary practice, the creative arts and scholarship in Morrison's career, the invited speakers will here explore her multifaceted historical and contemporary influence on authors, artists and thinkers, but also in critically shaping our global political narratives. We have Yvette Christensen, Rocio Cobo Pinero, Ashley Harris and Dana A. Williams. Uh, Yvette Christensen is a Claire Tao Professor of Africana Studies and English Literature at Barnard College. She is both a creative and an academic, with a debut novel entitled Unconfessed, and an important critical work entitled Toni Morrison and Ethical Poetics. Rocio Cobo Pinero is an Associate Professor at the Department of English and North American Literature at the University of Seville, Spain. She is the author of Sounds of the Diaspora, Blues and Jazz in Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, and Gail Jones. And her current research focuses on how contemporary Afro-diasporic women writers integrate into their literary works the influence of visual art, music, and popular material culture. Ashley Harris is a professor of English literature at Uppsala University. She is the author of Afropolitanism and the novel, Derealizing Africa, and is currently working on a monograph titled Literary Form Beyond and Beyond the Book in Southern Africa. Dana Williams is Professor of African American Literature and Dean of the Graduate School at Howard University. She served as Chair of English at Howard University for nine years prior to becoming Dean. She is also President of the Tony Morrison Society. Her book on Toni Morrison as an editor will be published in 2024. Dana, I would like to start with you. Um, considering that Toni Morrison is an alumnus of your university, having completed her BA in English there, and then returning in her later years to teach um, students at your university, I am interested in the fact that her career, and forgive me if I'm wrong here, but her career seems to actually begin as an editor at Random House Publishers. Um, as this is a particular interest of yours, what, in your opinion, um, why does Toni Morrison take up this role um, as an editor? And how does this then influence her shift into writing? If you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Thank you so much for the question. And thank you for the invitation to join this panel. We're really excited about at least I'm certainly excited about some of the conversations that we will have and I look forward to this opportunity to celebrate Morrison in this way. As you noted, um, Morrison began her undergraduate career as a student at Howard, where she was an English and classics major, where she also participated in the Washington Repertory Players and the Howard Players, where she was a fairly well-known actress uh, around the campus for sure, and just a little bit probably around D.C., because a part of the work that they did on the stage at Howard was also a part of the local conversation um, and some representations, particularly of some interpretations of Shakespeare that were televised um, in DC at the time. Um, after she um, went to graduate school at Cornell, not long after finishing her undergraduate degree at Howard, she came back to Howard to teach actually. And as is still the case now, interestingly enough, generally PhD programs give you seven years to earn the PhD. And if you don't after seven years, then you move on to another career. So this was the case for Morrison. She taught 
in the Department of English Intro to Humanities courses for seven years and freshman writing and composition courses before meeting that seven year mark where um, she then didn't have the opportunity to renew the co contract again. She was less interested, I think, in earning the PhD, just more interested in the life of the mind in a general sense. And as the story goes, she um, worked on this short story that she shared with a writing group that she was spending time with. And that story became the bluest side. It doesn't come out though until she's also in the process of being hired as an editor. Um, and again, we hear her talk about the kind of serendipity of that moment where she gets two copies, not one, but two copies of this ad and decides to apply for it, even though she has very little editorial experience. And I say very little because um, Claude Brown was her student at Howard. And so she had read Manchild in the Promised Land and given him feedback on that. She had also been one of three editors for a college reading skills textbook. So she had some sense of what it took to make a textbook work, but um, no direct training in editorial skills. Um, so when she becomes the editor at Random House, well, well first, L.W. Singer, a textbook company, um, and the irony of sorts of the current conversations around book bans and textbooks because she learned in that space too that the, the nation follows California, Texas, and Florida in terms of textbooks because of the size of these um, school populations and everyone else who had other ideas just had to like push them off to the side because those school districts really dictated what would make for the cheapest textbook because they would um, really make the, the, the best offer. So moving out of textbooks, she shifted into um, trade. And I can talk a little bit more about how that opportunity came to her, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that she had this really small novel that was doing really well critically, even if it wasn't selling, called The Bluest Eye. And she really attracted the attention of the editors who thought that it was a really smart book and thought that the potential for her to help writers as a writer think about their own writing was great. I think I'm, I'm uh, thank you for that, that um, um, feedback. I mean, I'm, you know, we, we know of Toni Morrison as, as an editor, but to learn that she didn't actually have very much editorial experience when she got the job, um, because yeah. I think Toni Morrison is being um, a very astute writer. And, and I imagine that editing in itself helped in terms of her development in, in her own writing. But let's stick with editing because um, so her career as an editor flourishes. Um, she starts editing prominent African-American personalities, uh, Muhammad Ali, Angela Davis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then she makes a pretty brave move and starts looking at African writers and edits their work um, and comes out with a book called Contemporary African Literature in 1972. Um, where she edits the works of the likes of um, Chinua Achebe, Wale Soyinka. Um, she also pays a lot of credit to um, the likes of Bessie Head as someone who influences her own mm -hmm. right. Um, where does that move happen and why? It actually is the first book that she edits. Huh. And it was at L.W. Singer, that textbook company, and she felt very comfortable in that space because, after all, she had been a teacher and she had used textbooks and she understood how to make those decisions about which book was the best one to use, which ones would she have the most stories or the most poems that she would have students read so she didn't have to craft an anthology of sorts. So really, editing contemporary African writers was, how do I put together the book I wish I had as a teacher? Mm -hmm. And it was also the book I can say in the first time that I interviewed her about this editorial project, it was the book she was also proudest of. She said that literally to me. And so I had all of these fiction writers that I wanted to talk about and I'm going through my list. And so she says, so have you seen a copy of Contemporary African Literature? And embarrassingly, I had not. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know that she had edited it because it had been at Singer and not at Random House. Wow. Singer eventually gets um, subsumed by Random House when they acquire them. Mm -hmm. And so she pulls the book off of the shelf and she says, and I, I have it here. And she says, isn't this just beautiful? Oh, wow. So she's looking at the artwork. And so she also talks about 
how she made the decision about which writers to include, which ones were easiest to get, which ones she just thought, I will not do this unless I have this author involved. And then she also talked about the artwork in the book, where she, along with her editors, um, made decisions about how to make the section breaks. And so as the Black book becomes the one that she's most well known for editing, it's really this contemporary African literature book that helps her to understand how do I put together an anthology with images? How do I make my section headings so that I understand or so that the reader can understand? Because I think she was conceptually aware, certainly, of what she wanted to convey. But how do I convey to the reader this movement of ideas to think about the full range of Blackness on its own terms. And so I think it's this book in particular that really locks her into that notion of avoiding the white gaze. Because as she's said, it's reading Chinua Achebe where she realizes that would never happen in African-American literature. This particular moment where the man is combing his wife's hair. And the idea here is the writer in America would probably be too obsessed with what will people think about this and that beauty of Black writers talking to themselves on the continent is something that I think that she embraces so completely and wants for herself and for other writers in the United States. So is is this what she means when, um, and this is coming from um, um, uh, her own um, documents and documentation with regard to African African influence on her literature. Is this what she means when she says that reading African literature actually gave her the freedom to write her own books? I mean, I find that quite interesting. What, if you know anything at all, you know, what precisely does she mean? Well, I think, again, it's that notion, um, and I think this is true of writers in the Caribbean as well, when African writers are writing to themselves and they aren't in the minority, they're talking to themselves and they're less concerned about who's watching, who's looking, whose intrusion um, am I trying to avoid? When you strip that away, you get to say what you want to say and to be in conversation with each other, which is, I think, emblematic of her ethos with her books where every instance, the reader is involved in the making of the story as well. And finding writers who did that provided an opportunity that Invisible Man didn't. Because again, I think she says in this quote, like invisible to whom? Or Richard Wright writing against this notion that people will feel sorry for him. So the Black writers that she enjoyed and um, took inspiration for and read and thought about we're still grappling with the tension of racism and desegregation and segregation and integration in the U.S. in ways that African writers were not. The particular African writers that she's attracted to, I should say, because that's not to suggest that there aren't also African writers who are writing against colonialism, but there is the moment of intimacy between these characters where they're like, oh, we don't care who it is that we're Who's, who's watching or who's thinking. And I think that provided this inspiration to write characters in a particular way where you're talking to your own audience without worrying about who this will exclude, include. That, that idea of other, too, is something that I think she gets from the writers that she edits. This notion that othering is something that is of import to people who don't understand what it means to have a homeland. I will park our discussion because it leads quite well into Ashley's, but I do have a provocative question for you um, that involves the technical aspects of editing and the implications. And just for you to think about it, the implications, and it's, it's quite political, the implications of an African-American editing an African text. I'm quite interested in that dynamic um and also what you said that you know this is probably not a book that very many people know of um what what why is that the case would be a question for you but I'll, think... I'll, park, I'll park that and if we could discuss it I just want to give um Ashley a chance and then we'll come back and bring you back into the the discussion okay, okay? uh Ashley Yes. Um, you are typically interested in um, 
Tony, well, typically in terms of your own um, career, interested in um, literary form um, in African literature, et cetera, et cetera, or the efficacy of conventional literary forms, as it were, um, in, in its um, ability to represent African realities. Uh, but I think something people are not aware of is you're also a Morrison scholar. Um, and I think my first encounter with you and your academic, academic work was through a Tony Morrison paper. Um, so... I wanted to ask you, and this is shifting the perspective somewhat from um, the influence of African writers on Toni Morrison's work to Toni Morrison's influence on contemporary African writers. And you have a particular interest in that yourself. Um, you, If you could name for us um, a few artists that you think of as being particularly influenced by um, Toni Morrison in South Africa. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I should also just add, um, I wouldn't really call myself a Toni Morrison scholar anymore. I did my PhD on, on Morrison's work, but that was many years ago. Um, so I'm really um, delighted to be returning to her work in this, in this conversation um, and to, to think about these, these lines of influence <clears throat> between, between her work and, and the African continent. Yeah, um, Morrison's legacy in, in Africa is... Um, I think too large to 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 be uh, covered in in such a short amount of time. But um, you see you see her her influence a, a, across the um, sub-Saharan continent um, very much so in um, Nigerian Ghanaian writing. Somebody like um, Taisa Lassi, who actually was mentored by by Morrison. Um, you can really I've written about the the extent to which you can see it on the level of style. Um, um, phrasing, actual word choice. You can, you, it's really a, um, Ghana Must Go by Taya Selassie is actually, a, a, it's, it's drenched in, in, a Mor in Morrison's aesthetics, you could say. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other ways in which her, her work has, has influenced writers. Um, Yvonne Vera, um, Zimbabwean writer, um, who's sadly and tragically um, passed very, very uh, young, um, I had a conversation with me when I was doing my PhD on Morrison about the extent to which Morrison's work had influenced her. Um, and the influence is a little is a little less obvious in Vera's case. Um, and that sort of leads me to the, the current South African situation, which is to say that um, Morrison, Morrison is, a, is an enormous figure of inspiration, I would say, for, for uh, particularly uh, black women, writers and and uh, poets in in south africa um i'm a little hesitant to use the word influence be precisely perhaps because of that provocative question that you've put to dana about um you know these questions of kind of cultural capital and and i kind of i don't want to set up a hierarchy in which morrison is some kind of figure of authority uh, aesthetically that then we suggest that south african writers follow or mimic um, because that's not the, it's not the case at all. Rather, uh, I think that actually one can turn to Morrison's own um, view of how influence operates. Um, if I may just quickly refer to her Nobel um, lecture, uh, her acceptance speech at the Nobel Prize. Um, she tells a wonderful tale about a, an old um, griot and clairvoyant woman who some youths try to trick um, because they think that she's a fraud, they want to expose her as a fraud. And so they go up to her and uh, say that they're holding a bird in their hand and they want to, her to say whether the bird is alive or dead. And Morrison chooses to use this, this, um, this story, which she's heard many times in her youth, to represent um, language itself. And the, and, and, and the old woman is a creative writer and this is the literary art, right? And so the old woman says to them, I don't know if the bird's alive or dead ultimately. The young people respond wanting to be told, kind of, you know, you, you've got to guide us, you've got to show us the way. And she refuses. She, ref she stands in a space of silence and says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to do with this. And Morrison ultimately is suggesting that um, it's not her, her role as having now had this achievement, the Nobel, winning the Nobel Prize, it's not going to be her role to be a guide in that sense for a younger generation. Instead, um, what she says as she as she thinks about um, as she closes her speech, I'll just quote her. 
She says that she, I will leave this hall with a new and much more delightful haunting um, than the one I felt upon entering. That is of the laureates yet to come, those who even as I speak are mining, sifting and polishing languages for illuminations none of us has dreamed of. And I think that's, that's her notion of influence and that's how I would like to think about influence in terms of South African writers now. Um, I think that Morrison's a, a, a major figure and I'll have an opportunity to mention a couple of writers now, but um, but I don't think that it's it's in any way a, 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 that that these writers are um, beholden to her in in that sense. Um, the two the two writers that I that I particularly focused on for today is um, Koleka Patuma, who probably doesn't need um, very much introduction to our South African viewers. Um, a major poet in in South Africa, a poet, uh, performer, um, dramatist. Um, and and works across these 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 multi um, multimodal um, forms of of the literary, and then um, Uhuru uh, Palafala, who is a, a, an academic as well, but um, who who is a poet who's just uh, just published a book called Mine 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 that um, that I think shows strong links to Morrison's thinking. Um, but if we have time, I can perhaps elaborate some of some of those lines of influence, as it were. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested, um, or one of the things you're interested in picking up on these um, two poets um, is what you've described as the queer trajectories. Now, you know, superficially, the minute you say queer tra trajectories, you're starting to think, you know, influence in terms of explorations of sexuality um, on another level also queer modalities in terms of you know living outside of what we see as conventional or, or normative ways of, of living um, I think of um, African-American writers exploring the notions of, of ghosts in Toni Morrison's mm -hmm. literature and how those come across as queer trajectories how are you seeing these queer trajectories work in these particular writers um, or artists' work. Great. I think I'll, I'll refer particularly to Kolek Patuma's work here, um, where where there's a her, her queer politics is is um, very um, well articulated. The so if we if we read queer in its narrowest sense, right? One could say that Morrison's work doesn't include much queer. So um, we could say rather that um, there's only, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think there's one gay couple across her work. It's in um, a mercy and uh, a, a gay white couple. Um, scholars, however, have extended, as you as you suggest, um, Aretha, that notion of of um, the queer to to include characters like Sula, who really resists. Um, a, a, a kind of normative placement of her, of her self knowledge and her sexuality, right? Um, but there is still a sense in which there is still a sense in which uh, Morrison's work, in in my critical assessment, perhaps has not has not fully engaged that particular space of the of the queer. And I see that um, right, writers like like uh, Kolek Patuma. Um, so she's really carving out a, a, a space for including in the archive of black women's writing that she went, that she is engaging with. She's carving out the, the significance and the importance of placing uh, queer concerns and, and also very concrete LGBTQI uh, issues um, into that space. And throughout her poetry, so if you if you have a look at uh, "Hello, Bye Bye Coco Come In," which is uh, from a song by uh, Brenda Fassi, who, who's herself a queer um, black uh, figure, um, what you see is that the the words "black queer" is all the way through the the poem are set off against the rest of the the the, the poems, and the poems are in alignment with this idea of of um, sort of writing her herself into a, a black written tradition, 
but black queer doesn't quite um, isn't quite in, in, in entwined in that yet, as it were. It's still at at odds. So there's this one wonderful um, moment in in Hello Bye Bye Coco Come In, which actually I think is a direct reference to Morrison's Beloved. Um, where in 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 Morrison's Beloved, the character Setha um, has to pay by sex to have the name beloved engraved on her child's grave and then um and Potuma's got a poem called at the cemetery um which reads as such as uh, just this one little section um sh she writes you buried yourself with the coffin your spine wanting nothing more than to be lowered down slowly like your beloved All right so there's the overt kind of uh link there and then the next the very next line um shifts and we get we get told of mourners as women with a woman spelt with an x uh women who toss themselves about in the sand with no one holding them and we know that we're we're we're, we're talking about a trajectory that goes back to um slavery but we're also talking about corrective rape in south africa we're talking about women who are 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 abused as 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 lesbians and killed and that these are the beloveds that cannot be, um, you know, that the, the mourners cannot just want to sink down into this grave. So she's kind of hooking on this 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 important issue, um, I think, to 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 Morrison's work overtly here. And to me, that's what I call this queer trajectory of 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 that line of influence, as it were. I I. I totally appreciate what you're saying about you know not hierarchizing um influence as it were and, and the subtleties and the ways in which we read and make these connections i think is, is significant in terms of tony morrison's influence um how do we then shift to to uhuru palafala um and i think of um the work that she does um and your interest in her particular um discussions and and research around the black radical condition uh, tradition my mm -hmm. question to you with regard to uhuru palafala is first of all if you could contextualize for us you know the the black radical tradition in in the ways in which she conceptualizes it and how if at all you see tony morrison's i don't even want to say influence maybe interplay <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So again, it's it's um, it's oblique. It, I mean, it, that's that's the 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 other element here, which is not to say that it's not significant this this interplay. But um, so yeah, so Uhuru um, Palafala, she's got this wonderful notion of the matriarchive, right? That she develops in her theoretical and academic work, but which actually also um, is very much part of her her uh, book of poetry, Mine, Mine, Mine. Um, and her idea there is that that if that that really the the, the narrative of of a, a black radical tradition has been um, dominated too much by a, a patrilineage, quite simply, and that one can open up other um, kinds of um, actually lines of influence if one thinks about a matriarchy. So. Um, for example, she's reading uh, Eskia Pachlele's work and um, and thinks about the influence literally of his mother in in the, the creation of, of of his 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 um, his aesthetic, his way of dealing with uh, with 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 the world. Um, now, I think that it's to me it's very clear that Toni Morrison is one of many figures in this matriarchy um for a writer like uhuru palafala and that it's important that 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 it's not it doesn't have that kind of more linear it's not it's not a matrilineage but that 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 there's there's multiple voices a sort of community of um of voices that she's that she's she's drawing on there um and what is interesting is that she she also in, in her in her um book mine 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 same as uh, koleka patuma both writers, both of these poets re refer to multiple women who have influenced them and men, but mostly women. Um, and neither of them overtly name Toni Morrison, but both of them refer 
to characters from Morrison's work. I find that so fascinating that actually, and they're doing it, they're interweaving these names with historical figures. So Patuma, for example, takes uh, Winnie Mandela and um, um, the uh, Sarah um, Bartman, the, the so-called hot and thought Venus historically. And then suddenly we get Jadine and Sula and Pekula and, and Beloved. Um, so it's an overt link in, right? But she's, she's and, and in Pal uh, Palafala, we get um, Dorcas, who, who now from, uh, carries her from jazz. In jazz, she's a, a victim of a murder and she's, and she's young. And, and, but in, in, in Palafala's work, Dorcas has become queen pin of the reef. Okay, she really knows herself. She knows her own sexuality. She's really kind of inhabiting herself. And I think, I think this is this kind of sense of these writers kind of taking, taking this into play and then just going somewhere else with it. And, and I think that this, this idea of the matriarch of that if it can include characters as much as writers, as much as historical figures, it gives us a sense of, of how that interplay operates, I feel. I, I have to say, just listening to you, um, I'm thoroughly fascinated. I'm already starting to think of ways in which I could incorporate this into my teaching, which I think, you know, so much has still to be done. But um, if I can move on to, to Rocio, because um, you're also in, interested in the you know, creative arts and Toni Morrison's influence in that regard. And you're particularly interested in music. You've published a book on Toni Morrison's influence, um, or not just Toni Morrison, but African-American female writers um, in terms of blues and jazz. Um, why you've pretty much feel that this is an understudied area in Toni Morrison. Why do you think that's the case? Thank you, uh, Arisa, for the question and, and for inviting me to this uh, fascinating uh, round table. Well, um, the, the uh, influence or the echoes of music in Toni Morrison's uh, over, it, it's, it's been widely discussed and, and I published the book you referred to on, on, on that, on the influence of music, blues, jazz in Toni Morrison. And actually uh, there is a scholar, Alan Rice, and uh, Aretha, you, you and, and myself, we met through Alan Rice because he was one of the first to discuss the, the influence of jazz in, in Toni Morrison. And we met in, in the Institute for Black Atlantic Research. Um, so yes, the the influence of music on on her novels has been widely discussed, uh, but not the the opposite. The echoes and the resonances of Toni Morrison's writing on musicians and visual artists, and I'm very interested about that. I I came across Carmen Gillespie's. Uh, volume, Toni Morrison, 40 Years in the Cleaning, in the Clearing, I'm sorry, and that was uh, published in 2012. And that uh, volume explores Morrison's interdisciplinary collaborations, including music and visual art. And well, Dana was uh, before mentioning the, uh, how she was involved, Toni Morrison, in, in acting and, and also in the Black Book, editing the, the Black Book, this uh, interdisciplinary uh, edition with, with photographs, with music. So um, I was interested in, 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 that, in that collection in Carmen Gillespie's. And so I, uh, I, I read there that um, the multifaceted alliances, uh, aside from theater, with Toni Morrison began in 1992 when the Carnegie Hall Corporation commis commissioned Morrison and composer André Previn to create Honey and Rue, specifically for soprano Kathleen Battle. And the score contained uh, six songs. Toni Morrison wrote the lyrics of the songs and then they recorded the album in, in, in 1995. And that would be the first of many musical interdisciplinary collaborations because uh, Toni Morrison uh, participated in the production of Degas in 1995, a uh, theater production with jazz uh, musician Mark, uh, Max uh, Roach, later a libretto uh, for Sweet Talk in 1997 with composer Richard 
Daniel Port. She would collaborate with uh, Richard Daniel Port again for the libretto of, of the opera Margaret Garner, based on Beloved, her novel Beloved, that was in two, 2005. Also a song cycle, Woman Life Song, uh, that, that came out in year 2000. So these musical collaborations are very uh, extensive, they're wide. And so the, the first one, Honey and Rue forged, she says, Morrison in, in an interview, it, it forged a new creative path be, beyond novel writing that motivated her to inaugurate the Princeton Atelier in 1994. And, uh, some people might not know about this this atelier. It was under the auspices of of Princeton University that she could create this artistic pro uh, program that invited to campus to Princeton world class artists of all genres for an intensive one semester collaboration with faculty with with students and so musicians when they, when they're like anonymous for percussionists, uh, cellist, Yo-Yo Ma, composer, uh, Rachel Daniel Poe that I just mentioned, all the theater director and opera director, Peter Sellers, who described the, the atelier as an interdisciplinary, intercultural, non-hierarchical and radically open space. So it was a great, beautiful, artistic, interdisciplinary uh, space to create, to be creative and, and to be um, doing something uh, larger and, and experimental as well. And, and that's how I also, through the atelier, I, I came across two musicians of Igbo Nigerian descent based in the United States, uh, Mendy and Kito Badiki, because they um, they stayed there, they collaborated there in, in, in 2005. By the way, the atelier, the Princeton Atelier is still running after it was inaugurated by Toni Morrison. And uh, these two Nigerian musicians uh, developed a masquerade uh, a project while they were there. But five years later, they released a beautiful ballad, a folk ballad uh, entitled The Good Hand that refers to to uh, Toni Morrison's Nobel lecture acceptance of, of the Nobel uh, Prize and Ashley has referred to the to the story to to the allegory that uh, she so eloquently delivered and and these musicians Mendy and Kitho Badiki refer to that, uh, to that allegory and to the, the symbology of the bird and, and language. And in their song, what's held in, in, the, uh, in the children's hand is not a bird, but it's, it's, uh, it's language, it's the word itself. And, and the blind sage uh, is connected with Toni Morrison's good hands and, and they, they say brilliant soul. In the in the song, if you have a chance to listen to to the good hand, uh, because uh, uh, we'll listen to a different song um, later, but not not this one. So that that's one musical collaboration that I found interesting and and that um, started in the atelier and and it so, continues. So, so, so just to be clear, so your interest is actually the ways in which contemporary musicians are reading Toni Morrison's work and this is what's influencing their productions. I think that's fascinating in terms of that whole understudied um, aspect because I mean I think if you've read about Toni Morrison one of the things she makes clear and the Paul Gilroy interview in particular is that her books music informs her books. Um, you know I can think of jazz being for me one of the most beautiful books to teach um it continues to teach you because it's such a beautifully musical book but also technically quite demanding um but the if we if we can if we could um speak to your interest in akua naru who has a rap um i'm interested in the title of the rap it, it comes across as a uh, an homage to tony morrison and if you could just give us a bit of context like why this rap and why rap in particular? Um, yeah. 
Well, uh, Kuanaru, she's a musician of Ghanaian descent, uh, a diasporic uh, musician. Uh, she's based in, in Germany. And hip hop, well, the role of, of, of uh, Black women in, in hip hop has been quite controversial, but uh, well, she changes. She, uh, I think that Akuanaru uh, uses hip hop, rap, and, and also she combines blues and, and jazz as well in, in her music to uh, invoke Black women's lived experiences and, and creative history. And so she's very much inspired by by Toni Morrison. And she quotes very frequently in the interviews at um, what Toni Morrison said, uh, we're going to do this work at the margins and you're all going to come and gather at the margins, like it's the center, which is a, a beautiful uh, uh, turning of the uh, perspective and, and also turning around um, also hip hop and, and hip hop culture, which was, used to be very patriarchal, it's not anymore. And when you said, when you uh, referred to my early studies uh, focused on, on uh, the influence or the echoes of music on Toni Morrison's work, which she's, uh, like you said, uh, Aretha, she's acknowledged elsewhere and jazz proves that. But the, that uh, dialogue with musicians, I thought it, it's it's more uh, understudied. And if we might, before I continue discussing Akuanaru's uh, album, uh, The Minor Scannery, and there is a song, the 11th song is entitled Toni Morrison, and it's entirely dedicated to uh, her work. In the live performance that we're going to, to listen to, just two minutes, she does not um, go through the different, uh, Toni Morrison's different novels. She does in the CD. I, I still buy CDs, by the way, and, and vinyls. And uh, so, and it's a work of art, the, this one, because of the, the, the cover, uh, a Ghanaian artist uh, designed it. And um, so, as I was saying, in the CD, she goes through uh, Morrison's novels and uh, the relevance of each in the singer's life. She doesn't introduce uh, the live performance as such, but uh, you, we can listen to, to the, uh, the first two minutes and then um, we'll go back to, to the lyrics and, and how they speak to Toni Morrison's Blue Eye, Jazz, Sula, uh, Ashley also mentioned Sula, the, the the symbology of the birds, and 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 we can well, if, continue if, the, the discussion. If we can, if we can get you to play that clip, and then we'll go on to a vet, and then we can incorporate um, the discussion on Akuan uh, Nura in the broader discussion. But if you could play that clip, then we can all share in um, what you're discussing. Right. Thank you. Let's. Is it on? Yep, it is on. Thank you. Everybody ready? Yes. To wonder who's little girl am I The fifth woman inside Banging some on her mama's own 45 Or a score for the blue side Kept that young and gon' tie The tilt for cola boy that bird in the mind most vulnerable kind, black girl lost the confine In that double conscious outline by the boys in the prime Who heard us cry when the dawn told us black was a crime Arrest your walk with that sword in your spine Auction off tragic victim of time Set us a wine for memory Collective genetic took you to write that simile Inscribe the cage, find joy Through the pain of Frankie Beverly Trapped in a maze, made niggas and slaves Readers and maids, made the lay on made bed Spread legs, sweet and masses, entertainment Prescribed invisible lives till you reclaim Denied the white gaze, another brush to paint with I go one hand, hold the pen, one pen Hold the people, y'all, tell me 
Take one hand, hold the pen, one pen, hold the people, y'all. Listen, uh, I said, how can one hand, hold the pen, one pen, hold the people, y'all. Yes, uh, how can one hand, hold the pen, one pen, Tony Morrison, Tony Morrison, uh, now though the world was three fifth and fractured, we hold main characters, female protagonists, centralized blackness, that's all, baby, jazz riff that came after, Shabrak, trauma when war left a shatter, a literary photograph capture, born before the womb, it was you who knew our magic from the rain and thunder, blunder, put life for compassion, showed us that the bottom was the top we can imagine, huh, he are you right with the hands of God, layers for saws, calm pours, Felicia Rashad, reading your storm over us all, mother and daughter bonds, braided and torn, or the chaos, who will watch the burn from the front yard, mother a metaphor, the height of Zeus, be a lexicon, song of Solomon, songs, Quran, I pull it up, Nobel Prize in human form, the living, the dead, you honor the soul, but how can one hand hold a pen, one pen, hold the people, y'all, oh my goodness, how can one hand hold a pen, one pen, hold the people, y'all, yes. Well, I'm sorry, a Kuanaro. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's safe to say we were all getting pretty caught up there. Um, and listen, if if we can park this and keep it for discussions, I I have my own questions, but I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, but coming to a vet um, and talking about the the well, if you watch that video that um, um, Rocio played, it, it's pretty overt. The the sense of, of Tony Morrison's influence. And you've written a book, um, a novel, uh, your debut novel, um, which was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway. Congratulations. I didn't know that. Um, but um, your book is, is read as being um, a reworking and or rejoinder to Beloved, um, Tony Morrison's Pulitzer Prize winning novel that everyone who's read Toni Morrison has pretty much read, beloved. Um, I guess for me, the question is for you, the writer, um, was this the case? Was it when you were writing it? Was this the rejoinder to um, the South African rejoinder as it was? Um, or, yeah, if you, if you could tell us what informed the book and, and how it came to be read as the, the South African rejoinder to Beloved. Thank you, Aretha, and um, thank you, Dana and Ashley and Rosia. I um, just I have so many questions and this conversation that you've all generated is um, so inspiring. Um, you know, uh, I, I for some reason you asked that question, I have this notion of the future anterior, it will have been. Um, you know, I think that any writer is going to tell you that there are all of these convergences and that sometimes you don't even know what the influences are. Uh, I grew up with stories of what had happened in Cape Town. My, my grandmother has um, had a memory of her mother having been a slave on St. Helena and her father as well. So I grew up in the high and dry felt of Johannesburg uh, thinking about Cape Town. And the stories that were told about uh, slave women who had aborted um, or who had uh, turned their babies' faces over, uh, particularly in the slave lodge. And I remember my mom telling me about a man, uh, Thunberg, who had traveled in the 1770s to Cape Town and who had described seeing floating off the waters of the, of the slave lodge, which were at that time right up, you know, and then eventually sort of pushed, pushed away to, to call it reclaimed land uh, before shore. But talking about seeing fetuses floating off the water. And um, I, I, I tried to find it to give you the quote today, but it's one of those things that's so spectral, it so horrifies me that I, it, just, it slides away like pearls on a porcelain dish. I can't hold on to it. But um, so, so there were those narratives. I was in the archive uh, looking up and doing some other research on this longer project on liberated Africans, and I found in this official document of a new uh, police superintendent a request in the middle of all of his, his um, very dry bureaucratic language, a reference to this woman, Scylla, 
Why is she still alive and why is she still in the, in the prison? And the language, the tone of the language changed. And I, I was, I, I, I was, re- couldn't not look at her. Why did she appear in this? Um, the short version of it is that I eventually found out that she'd been in prison for having murdered her son on uh, the 24th of December, 1823. 18, uh, and, uh, that she'd been sentenced to death by strangulation. Her son, Baro, was nine years old. She'd been sentenced to death by strangulation. She was brought all the way from Plettenberg Bay Bay to the prison in Cape Town for the sentence to be carried out. Um, All of these years later, it's 1820. I I should know. I should know these dates by heart because it drives me um, crazy. I think it's about 1826 that this new superintendent comes and says, why is she still alive? Turns out she's been used as a prison prostitute. She's born two children while in prison. uh, The superintendent um, petitions, there's an investigation, and it's very clear that she and her children had actually been freed by an owner, who in the novel is just called Old Missus, Old Missus. And that the woman's son had stolen her freedom by changing her name slightly and selling her out of the main uh, district of the Cape of Good Hope to this distant um, place in Plittenberg Bay. And she's pardoned 14 years hard labor. I was not aware of Morrison when I was writing and doing all of that research. It took me 10 years to chase this and, and find that I could write this novel. But I am a reader of Morrison. And so, you know, I I don't know whether uh, it is that Morrison opened the gate. I don't know. But but certainly I she's one of those writers that I think made a space for someone like me. At the same time, like someone like Bessie Head made a space for me. At the same time, like the storytellers whom I grew up with made a space for me. And I think that structurally there are very, very radical differences between the Morrison and between Unconfessed. And one of the things for me is that it has to be a South African story, absolutely. And that meant it couldn't have the form of what has come to be called the the slave narrative, Mm -hmm. the autobiography. Um, For me, Morrison is an exquisite crafter. The, 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 her language is extraordinary. You know that she's walked those sentences. If you watch it, the, the, the stresses, you, the iambic comes in, unfoot, uh, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, and then you get these trochaic and all of these different variations. But you know that she's walking that because it's completely in her body and breathing. And I think maybe I get that from Morrison, is that so the, the, the lesson of it, the lesson of the discipline that every sentence has to have. but. I think also for me, it was formally that um, there is no legacy of slave narratives in that particular form, which I think is the first real American genre, right? If you say that jazz is an American genre, I think that the slave narrative is the genre that, that creates the American canon before it's the diaries that are familiar, it's the content. Now, the slave narrative in America, some scholars will tell you, had to take the form of the sentimental novel, right? Um, and, and I think it did and it didn't. I think that it was a tr- what, what people like Frederick Douglass did was a Trojan horse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for South Africa, I did not want Scylla, who was not an educated woman from what we could understand, to actually be doing that. The, the 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 issue is that you um you know Rosio you mentioned jazz and you look at that novel exquisite the the, the 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 main themes and then all the improvisations now for me Aretha it's orality 
it's the, I think that orality and jazz have something similar, and that is you have the main story you're telling, and then you know my grandmother's talking about you know how Cliffy came and ate the eggs, put a pin in the egg and sucked it out and then put the egg perfectly and so when she went to bake the cake oh my god there was no egg that damn cliffy but while she's telling you that story you know he came that day and you know he when he uh, by the way you know do, do, do you know that shirt he was wearing it's just like the one that mr gaffney had on that and then you have a little story about mr gaffney and then you come back so but you you you're gathering and you're moving and you're gathering and you're moving so it's that circular collecting that I think is improvisation and the side stories as well. Um, so those, those I think, I, I think you were talking about, you know, um, Ashley, about influence and, and questioning this word. And I, I really think that's a challenge for us, Aretha, because you said, you know, do we use influence? Um, is it that we walk next to each other? Or we walk with each other? Is it that, what, what is that beautiful, the matri matriarchy? Right. Um, so I, 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 I don't know, but, um, you know, Ashley, you also talked about these these characters that 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 people cite in the same time they're citing the names of real authors. And. And, you know, I, I was thinking of the characters and the specters, one thing for me about Scylla and everyone in her world, in a way, they're placeholders or, or in a way. Their names are, are, are epitaphs. They point, they say, hic jacet, here lies. And I and in all the, the connotations of lies, right? All the echoes. That those people are kind of like the specters that you might say are, are in Morrison's novels. And the specters are maybe people who are who were but are not yet part of the imaginary. And when you read them like characters, a character is not yet until you read it. The reader animates the character and then whether that character lives on is up to the reader, right? And so I kind of think that there is those, there are those kind of parallels, those learnings, because, you know, if you, I don't know about Dana and, and Ashley, I mean, Dana, Dana you know, Avery Gordon has this wonderful book called Ghostly Matters, where as a sociologist, she takes very seriously the haunting, haunting. And, you know, this is this is real I, in, in, in America. It's real in any any um, culture. If you I, I hear the anthropologist yelling culture, I don't use that word culture. I have I use culture. Um, you know, in South Africa, I grew up with that. I grew up with dukums. Um, Ashley, you know, um, you know who who would go and have an old Coke bottle. Why it always had to be an old Coca Cola bottle. There's many ones, and if there was somebody was doing something to someone, the dukum went and he put the Coke bottle to the to the keyhole, and suddenly there was a puff of smoke, and he closed it quickly with a playing card, and he was going to take it somewhere to a field. I don't know where in Johannesburg you had a field with a cow in it. And then he would put the bottle on the side of the cow and the ghost would go into there. What the cow did to that dukum, I don't know, to deserve that. And he really should be hauled over the coals. But, you know, we grew up with tokolosh. We grew up with, with the, you didn't leave a scissors open. You didn't, or you didn't um, uh, drop a knife. You didn't, you know, you, 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 you were very careful about how you placed your shoes at night, right? in case a ghost stepped into them. So I think we're all societies are haunted, but what it is is that someone like Morrison becomes part of the, 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 the guides, the pilots, the, the generous ones. Yeah, I went too long, sorry. No, no, no. I, I think you're, you're spot on. I was going to say, just listening to all of you, I think the thing that comes across most for me is how generous Morrison was yes. and, and I yes. I'm not I'm from what I've read I think you know she, she certainly went out of her way to do it but I think she probably underestimated just how what she had achieved by way of opening spaces for yes. other generations um and as we are going to open this to a discussion I wonder if it yeah. If you yourself could actually read from us an expert okay. from um, um, Unconfessed, because like you, I think there are definitely parallels and comparative par parallels in right, your right. novel and Morrison's. But, right. you know, your approach 
to this central issue is quite different. And yeah. the thing I find when I've read Unconfessed, and I think I've had this conversation with, with Ashley with regard to the fact that, you know, Beloved is taught and we have a novel like yours that should actually be taught in South African schools because our students are more familiar with African-American slavery than they are with slavery on the continent, which is mm -hmm. thoroughly saddening. But, um, you know, if you could read from us an expert, an excerpt, and then we can... Yeah. Just but if I could just say in relation to that, I think that one of the, the differences is that um, I have a theory, and that is um, Governor Somerset, like his governor in the 1820s, he and others realised the success of the slave narrative, mm -hmm. and they control the printing press, absolutely control the printing press in South Africa. You are not going to get a slave narrative out. And the Cape Colony farmers, the burghers, are completely... They're, they are seeing what's happening in America and they are shutting everything down. So just to say that that there is an influence from America mm. and it's hell no. Mm. Right. Um, I'm going to read just a little excerpt. Um, for those who don't know, the novel is primarily set on Robben Island um, and it's Scylla, this woman, who is basically, it's a love song to her dead son, Baro, who comes to him, who comes to her. But other, other uh, presences come as well. And one is O Missis. And this is Scylla um, with Baro. Shh, shh. In that bush, O Missis, that dress of hers hisses and all the fane boss is alive. Now she's moving those skirts to the fane boss. And I know who she looks for, but you are mine, Baro, and you are good to keep out of her way. She thinks she will see in you a son who will never disobey a mother because she is lonely now. There is not one person who says her name on this earth and she can feel what it is to be a dress that goes grayer and thinner with each year. And she can already feel the light shining through one place today, another one a week later. Soon there will only be one patch left and that patch will not even remember it was once a woman who owned so much land and had people she could call hers to do with as she would. And to call her O oh, Missis is not name enough to help her, for her other names were forbidden and my mouth cannot begin to speak the forbidden, even when it is a forgiveness needed. And that is why O oh, Missis comes with those skirts in the fane boss looking for you, Baro, and me, looking to see if we can at last be disobedient and forget that she is Oh, Mrs. And not that name on the paper that her son disobeyed. Empty paper, empty name. And look there, there. Shh. So, you must be quicker than that. She runs so when the birds pick at her and the snake king comes to see who was calling him with the voice that is forgetting its own name. Shh, shh. Softly, softly. Keep still. Do not look. She's passing. Let her pass. Do not look. Yeah. She goes so quickly. But one sound from us and she would have been here with those torn skirts and wild hair. She would want you for a tooth. She would, my Baro, boy, boy, Baro. No teeth in that head. No cheeks. No cheeks. No smile. No smile. No friends. No friends. No one to remember your name, and you would make a sweet tooth. Let her go. She will not come again for a long time now. She wants what little hair she has, and the birds want it too. Maybe she will forget and come no more. Come no more, O oh Missis. Sleep, O oh Missis, there where the forgotten ones lie. Sleep and keep that little bit of hair. Forget Scylla. Forget her boy. Sleeping is forgetting, and forgetting is peace. Remember only this. Yvette, thank you for that. Um, it's been thank a while since I've read that. And, and what I wanted to say is bringing back the subject of language, um, yes. what Morrison does with language and what you do with language in your book. Um, I have to say, when whenever I have read Unconfessed, I've read it twice, 
I found it extremely difficult. Like the language is extremely yes. difficult to get around. And for me, rather than going, oh, it's a difficult book, I'm going to put it down because clearly it's not working. I'm thinking perhaps that's the point. It's not so much that it's the point. It's, it's you know, and this is what maybe, this is it's what Gertrude Stein maybe taught me, is that if you, if you listen, it's mm. a book to listen to. And then you hear the cadences, those mm. those oral cadences that that have their own logic. And so there is there, you know, there's there, there are different languages in the book, actual actual mm. languages. So there's um, I try to imagine the early Afrikaans, which was called a combase tile, the kitchen language, which is the language that slaves made up. And then around the turn of the 20th century, as the Dutch descendants are trying to create them themselves as African, um, they they take the brain, the brown and the black out, right? And they insert what they believe is Dutch. In fact, they're they're inserting Flemish, lowland Dutch, and immediately insert Afrikaans into the language hierarchies of, of, of the Netherlands. Um, but but it's listening to that to try and get those languages. I often also opted for a more formal tone in order to get the, the awkwardness of English for Scylla instead of trying to do what you know um uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston did. Yeah, I, I couldn't do that. I mean, Hurston, my God, oh, right? Um, but but it is, it's a book to listen to. It is, it is there. And radical fragmentation, uh, that that there is a logic there. But the fragment is for me, it's the fragment that allows Scylla to breathe unheard, unseen. Because the demand, that's the lesson for me of having studied um, African-American literature, American literature, is the demand of the, of the person who was considered a slave was that when you tell your story, you owe the world everything. And that also was the resurgence in the 1980s when you had critical race theory. Hello, everybody. I don't hear a planet falling out of its orbit because I said critical race theory. Um, right. I, that, that, that the expectation when you told your story was that you had to tell everything. You had to give the size of your underwear. Right. I wanted Scylla to keep the size of her underwear private. Right. And so in the in the spaces between the, the fragments, there she goes. Um, you know, the, the one thing also is that is that, you know, I, I don't know, Dana, you know, the, the, the Toni Morrison used to say she doesn't write poetry and she got would get pretty steamed up if someone said, oh, your novels are poetic. Right. And I remember talking, asking her this one day and she was pissed off she really was she and and I I in a way I, I understand because it's a way of dismissing for, for people who's oh poetry but uh, you know poetry taught me something also and what poetry taught me was listening in the way that I think Morrison listens to to the to the 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 length of the walk the stroll that she's taking right is that that poetry teaches you to listen, taught me to listen for when there was the particular tension of the line of language and when you needed prose for the more languid expansion. And yet, how did you keep that, that um, amplification that allowed affect? And for me, the ideal is for the language to disappear. That's what a poet really has to have, right? Is that the poem has to exist and the poet must not be visible. That's the puppetry. You see the puppet master and the and the puppet, and you completely believe in the puppet. That's the poem. But then prose has to borrow some of that because you have to listen to the character. And that's why actually I love this thing that that it's Dorcas and others who are being cited. That's the dream. I keep quiet now. No, I, I was going to say, please go ahead, because this this is the discussion format, and I would like to not ask formal questions. So if you have a question for Ashley, by all means. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm listening to all of you now and, and thinking exactly what you're saying that, and, and Tony Morrison says this, you know, for, for something to work, actually, language needs to get out the way. Um, but, there's, but then there's also something about 
the way in which she writes language that demands your attention. And, and for me, this is what when I teach my students, because, you know, this is a dilemma we, we tend to have, you know, oh, God, Tony Morrison, I've been told it's ethnic studies, so, you know, and I'm like, first of all, uh, it's not ethnic studies. Second of all, by the time they finished the course, they all thoroughly love Morrison and thoroughly hate me because of all the work that we had to do together. Um, so my point is, you know, this she she is a demanding writer and and that for me so exactly what you're saying of it you know on the one hand there's the poetry of you know you're you're listening and and the language has to get out the way but then there's something about actually you need to pay attention to this language because something is being done here that's very yes. different from what you you typically read absolutely um, yeah can i just say because I, and i think it's not either or because when mm. we have these conversations we feel that we have to say oh it's this and not that it's all of them together and and sometimes one is more uh, comes forward more and, and more the other but we do have to pay attention to language absolutely because language is what names us mm. right it's it's having to learn how to not make the capital c colored name who i am so that's how i learned the difference between a noun and a verb my mom bought me a coloring book. So if someone asked me in the South African parlance, and, and you know, I use the OU in, instead of the American spelling to distinguish what colored means in South Africa, which means to mis be miscegenated, to be mixed, right? In America, it's, it's, it's a, I, 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 I'm considered black because I can't say colored. Um, and I don't want, I do not identify as white at all, though I had a white grandfather and he never identified me as white either, right? But, but colored, if I was asked, and God, why people felt they could just stop a child and ask, what are you? Um, I would say I'm coloring because I learned the verb. And I really believe that that is what language is also doing, that when you take it and you place a particular word in a different context, you hear the other, other purchases that not only one uh, ideology has, has, has claimed. And I, I wonder if I may, Dana, just to, to bring this back full circle, um, I, I still would like to ask my rather provocative question, especially um, as we're discussing issues to do with hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In your reading, because um, Tony's not here to answer for herself, but um, what, what, what are the implications of the editorship of African writing? by an african-american writer because i think of the process of editing um and you know what um, yvette was talking about slave narratives i mean those were edited for white audiences and of course that's not the analogy i'm trying to draw here what i'm suggesting is that editing is a very technical process and as we know tony, Mor tony morrison was good at that she is about words my question is what for for African writers, and I think this also speaks to Ashley. I think we've we've had quite a, a heated non-discussion about this. What you know, what does it mean where African writers' work is edited by people from elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. Um, I think Morrison was also aware of how politicized that question would be. So for contemporary African literature, for instance, she had um, two official on the record editors, and then she was just kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. selling the contract for the book. So of the two um, official editors, one was Gambian by birth, the other one was an expatriate U.S. person who had been in Ghana longer than he had been in the U.S. So that solved some of the problem, but their introduction also relied heavily on the writers themselves. So I'll just share just a, a line, well, the opening line, which is, let's see, I'll say two from this one in the introduction, which I think speaks to her awareness of how dangerous this could potentially be and how to avoid it. It says Africa was discovered by Africans, like full stop. 
simple as that statement is, it cannot be made too often. Mm -hmm. And then they go on to talk about um, the different views uh, from media, museums, publishing houses, particularly in the moment where this anthology comes to be when African independence movements and Black studies programs are really at the fore of people's imagination, which also meant that they were also at the fore of the publishing industry's tendency to exploit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so being very deliberate to say the writers themselves get to make decisions, it was also a little bit easier because many of the texts had been published already. So it was really a curatorial function, much more so than it was this kind of technical editing function. What was um, the moment of making decisions about how do I group the tales? How do I group the poems? How do I group the, group the drama and make certain decisions? Do I change in Googie's name? Mm -hmm. because it's published as one thing. And then in this revision, do I put this in parents or how does it work? Um, it goes on. So the popular view of Africa in America is distorted. So it really does put America on its back feet to say, this is an opportunity to, and again, I can't say it better, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> So the popular view of Africa in America is distorted. It varies from a cloying romanticism to staggering ignorance and a vague fear of that which is remote, to unstick the romanticism, to curtail the ignorance, and to eliminate the fear a collection of contemporary African literature should prove most useful. So they look straight at it in the face and say, we understand the distortion from all of the extremes. We understand the exploitation. We understand the privileging of one language or a European language over the other. So although Africans were writing in European languages, primarily English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, as early as the 18th century, and although from the beginning of the 19th century, for those who could read an African language, writings from the best of that tradition were available, it would be misleading to consider these works as the beginning of African literature any more than we can say that African literature began among those early Black uh, black writers in America. So it makes the point too that even writing in another language um, in translation is equally problematic. So they try to do things like footnotes um, to say this work can't be interpreted. We're not going to try. This is the closest approximation to what we can um, share with you. And then the mix of um, oral tales with the note, again, that this tale does not work as written down and read in the same way that it works as you hear it and so on. So I think really understanding um, the colonial moment, even in Africa, in the, in the midst of African independence moments, was something that there's no evidence that Morrison um, was aware of William Leo Hansberry, who was at Howard at the teaching at the time, um, and probably like in the U.S. considered a, a father of African studies. But his understanding of the privileging of the African perspective is something that certainly resonated with Sterling Brown, who she did take classes with. So there are these kind of extemporaneous relationships and tangential relationships. And the last thing I'll share just in relation to what Rossio was mentioning about the language. Um, so these connections are fascinating. In the theater, yes, but one of the mentors that she was closest to was James Lavelle, who has this huge book on the spirituals and the blues that rumor has it, Morrison edited it as well. So she's thinking about sound and language um, and thinking about music and the import of music into all traditions. Similarly, working with Owen Dotson, who's a great playwright who was on um, Broadway, but who was also her teacher, um, helping her to understand what does it mean to reinterpret a myth? One of his assignments for his classes was always like, rewrite this, rewrite the Tempest before these revisions in the colonial moment became popular. This was in the 40s and 50s. Well, she's at Howard from 49 to 53. But his assignments go back to the late 30s, early 40s. Like, what would it mean for this person to speak? So understanding how to give perspective to people who are supposedly objects is something that she learns from faculty. And um, the last person I'll mention, oh, 
and 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 oh gosh, I can't believe um, her name is escaping me. Oh, but I'll, it'll come to me. Ann Cook, because I can see her face as clear as day. Who taught her elocution classes and helped her to understand sound and language? Because the tradition at Howard was incredibly conservative around speaking. Mm -hmm. So we had students who were coming from all over the country, and the notion was you needed to be able to speak. I mean, it was colonialist. I get it, but. I, the point that I'm making is you needed to speak the King's English. So understanding how language works, how sound works was something that she also learned as she was thinking about how to perform on the stage. All of these things, how to create a scene, how to build a character, how to live into a character, how to hear and put that to paper without actually putting it to paper directly, how to force the reader to engage. All of those things, I think, come from an interest in and an understanding of how do I center my tradition? How do I center the African writer um, and an African aesthetic, even in a colonial moment, um, is something that I think she takes away from the beauty and the experience of being around populations of people where they are majority of the majority culture. I think that the one thing I find quite interesting, just bringing this back to, to Ashley, um, when you were talking about, you know, Dorcas here and the, the, the gift that Toni Morrison gives to people who read her work is the gift of hearing. Because what you're starting to do is, as you said, Yvette, you're listening, you're listening and you're making these connections, et cetera, et cetera, even though, you know, the influence is not overt. Um, but I've always, and, and this one's for you, Ashley, but with regard to hearing, and the one thing I found particularly interesting, the first time I was privileged to meet Toni Morrison, totally unawares, um, in Paris, she came to give a reading, and um, I remember saying to people, it was like, we were waiting for a rock star. Um, the room was packed to the rafters, people were sitting in aisles, sitting all over the place, um, and for me, it's actually quite a romantic moment. I, I romanticize my head. I remember she was seated under a little umbrella and it was raining. It was a red umbrella and I was already writing a novel in my own head. But um, the thing about Morrison that I find resonated in that room was that it wasn't, she brought people together. So the, for me, it's about hearing, because one of the things she was doing is she was actually speaking at this um, event. But the question I have for you, which has been posed to you before, Ashley, um, as a scholar um, who would present as being in the center, what is Toni Morrison's resonance for you? What, what do you hear when you read and engage with her work? Thank you. I think um, it's a very profound question and there's it, it would take me months, I think, to answer correctly. But um, but what I can say is that you've, you've really anticipated it. I think the answer lies in the ethics of listening. Right. So as a as a, a white Southern African, um, I think precisely the commanding voice that ensures the silence required to actually hear. Right. Um, I think that Morrison, so many writers, but we're talking about Morrison right now. I think Morrison, uh, her, part of her command and her literary genius um, is in being able to take us to the sites of absolute horror and to feel that, right? But to not, to not um, sort of talk over it, to not explain it away, to have to sit and listen. And I think I do actually, I, you know, um, when you say I've been asked this question before, I've been I've been asked I've been asked um, questions more overtly about what the the rights of, of of white academics are, for example, in teaching Morrison. And I and and uh, I think it's a very complex question in South Africa. Um, it, it has a certain kind of pertinence, but. In that respect, I think that Yvette gave us a beautiful phrase when she said, uh, the reader animates the character. Um, so each student reading Morrison um, reads, you know, animates those characters for themselves. The teacher's not blocking their access to those characters or to those texts. And I think that um, a little bit like um, 
um, Dana's uh, answer to your question about about the ethics of editing, my sense is that um, so long as one positions oneself with that kind of self awareness, um, and and an awareness that that one 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 doesn't I mean one doesn't have a right over the text, right? Um, I think it's better that that uh, students are exposed to this this writing. I remember teaching Morrison at Wits University in the in the in the 90s, you know, it was a it was a time, an exciting time to be discussing her work. Um, and I can imagine, I mean, this this uh, her, her editing African writers in the, in the 1970s, that book would have would have made those writers visible. And and those new readers would have animated animated those writings in all kinds of ways. So, um, but I think the the short answer is is um, yeah. The, the, there's an ethics of listening. And there's a dynamic that 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 imposes a kind of um, a, 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 a silence in which of one's own silence in which one has to actually acknowledge and hear. And I think that's part of her genius. Could I jump in unless Rocio, you wanted to say something? Um, I just this um Ashley, you know, you've 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 I'm so glad that you opened this. Because to me, this is the triumph of racism. It is the triumph of apartheid. If we begin to say no, you cannot, no, you cannot. Um at the same time, it's again not either or. Yes, there must be room and space made. I don't care what the Supreme Court does here, but affirmative action is necessary. It is absolutely necessary. And I do think this is about um, uh, learning how to rearrange the balance of things, how to, how to, the equity, my God, th these are not empty phrases, these words. And I think that, that in scholarship, in reading, in our communication with each other, and the ability to read and work with each other. This is the only way we can ever have a real dem democratic impulse is, you know, I'm, I hear myself channeling Benedict Anderson. It's the horizontal relationships that we have and not those genealogical vertical relationships. Uh, so I, I think it is very important. I mean, at the same time, I think, you know, Dana, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the homeland. And, I, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, if there was a shift in Morrison, because Mor the rootedness is in the 70s. Remember, that's ha Alex Haley's roots, which even made Australians stop and, and, and sit up and pay attention, right? The world sat up and paid attention. Um, and, and white Australians were saying, my family was in exile at that time, saying, we didn't know. How, and we're, so... So they needed to have that conversation all around the world because the world benefited from slavery, no matter where it was, whether it was in the continent or outside of the continent. Um, so, so th to me, the the to, to resist and to it's a pedagogical moment to teach students who want to see someone like them teaching them. I understand that. I absolutely understand that. And at the same time, I think it's so important for us all to, to, to make those horizontal connections and say that the world isn't the size of a pinhead on which there's only room for one, but that if your white professor is talking to you today, she's not the only person talking about Morrison. And by the way, Morrison is, her work is all over the world. And if you just were to listen, just imagine all the accents and the ethnicities and the what, reading Morrison. Uh, but I just wanted to say this is so, but at the same time, this is also why I think young South African writers must not want to write like Morrison. That you can write with Morrison, read with Morrison, but you must do what Morrison did. You must do what Zora Neale Hurston did. You must do what Bessie Head did, for God's sake, what Mafolo did. You must do what they did. Because, you know, that's uh, Dana, the, the translation is the idiomatic. It's in the idiomatic that the local lives and it's where the, the outsider encounters their outsideness. I now really truly shut up, sorry. Okay, um, well, I, I have been told by the technical team that sits in the background that we have a minute left, um, in which case what I want to say is, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, I think, again, this is testament to, to what 
Toni Morrison does. She opens up spaces. And I'm really, really glad that, um, you know, this has been an opportunity to, to have these uncomfortable discussions. Um, and yeah, Rocio, we'd like to give you the final word on account of not actually said anything in the saying. What a responsibility. I, uh, the ethics of listening, uh, going back to Ashley, what she said, uh, that's what really caught me about Morrison listening and sh I know that woman. And that that really, when when Yvette was reading, I, I was also listening, uh, um, well, the narrative voice in, in jazz and, and, and violet and, and quiet as it is kept. So the sound and the dialogue and speaking up and, and finding your own style, what what if it's, uh, the event uh, extraordinary recommendation to writers, uh, finding the style in dialogue with others and and finding your voice, and Morrison was a uh, unique voice and of course, she opened this space today and I'm I'm glad so glad to be a part of it and listening to you and learning from you so it's it's been a privilege to me so so thank you and um yeah uh, and a big thank you to aretha for guiding us so ably i mean what thank great you, questions aretha. oh my god, oh, oh my god. I, yes. I'm, thinking, I'm terribly sorry but this is going to have to happen again um <laughs> and it's going to be compulsory for the students we teach to actually sit here and they can question us and we can have even more robust discussions how does that sound like a plan? great <laughs> let's Fantastic. do it thank, thank you thank so you. much look at this thank gallery you. Of thank you this is i feel exactly that i'm looking at all these faces and thinking thank you so much for coming together um and for those who did tune in to um listen to this webinar i do hope that this was the point the, the ethics of listening um and um where we go from there thank you very much and um keep safe and we will keep in touch <laughs>